Hi, everyone. Hold on to your horses and tighten up your britches. Today, I have yet another set of shocking stories that are sure to make your head spin. You might even learn the truth about something that makes it impossible for you to sleep tonight. So get yourself comfortable, grab your favorite drink, and cozy up with that subscribe button. Thanks. Now let's get into the stories. Something wild happened to me in the summer of 2002. I hope you like it. I've told this story only a handful of times since then, and nearly every time I've told it, I've been disbelieved. But I know you will believe me, so I thought I would write in. I was 19 years old, and I decided that summer to head to Chicago on my own. I'm from a small town in rural Ohio, and I had never been on a big solo adventure. So even though it's really just a few hours' drive away... I thought it would be a good way to dip my toes into big city life and make for a fun adventure. I could tell my friends all about it when I got back, and I'd be staying with my cousin anyway. The only problem was that at that time in my life, I hated being alone. I craved the company of other people, and the drive out was feeling pretty lonely after the first hour or so, so that's when I decided to pull off at a rest stop just to not be alone. While walking in, this guy came walking up to me quickly, and he looked me right in the eyes and basically begged me to give him a ride. Yes, I know it was risky and dangerous to do it, but I told the guy I could take him as far as Chicago. I did tell him that I had one condition, and that was he had to empty his pockets and put everything he had in the trunk. I'd heard horror stories about hitchhikers being serial killers, and I wasn't going to risk him having a gun or a knife to stick at my throat. He agreed to my terms and he hopped in for the ride. At first, he seemed really cool and down to earth. He told me about his upbringing in Northern California, growing up with a twin sister, and how he had once worked in law enforcement. He was vague about his role in law enforcement, but I chalked it up to him maybe just having to leave the job for reasons he wasn't proud of. But this is where the story takes a turn for the weird. The guy told me that he was a former CIA agent and that he had wound up learning of a massive government conspiracy and cover-up regarding the Roswell, New Mexico discoveries. He said that we had essentially poisoned these visitors from outer space, declaring war on another planet, and that we were all now just sitting ducks, just waiting for them to finish assessing their options on how to deal a blow back to us. He went on to tell me about how he was going to uncover this information years ago and blow the top off of the whole thing, but that was when the CIA sent someone to kill him and dispose of the evidence. He said he managed to outsmart them, and that's why he was out in the world homeless, hitchhiking from city to city, just to keep from being found. At this point, I was regretting my decision to invite him along because I was thinking he was crazy and maybe a dangerous person to be around. I decided to change the subject to something a little less intense and hopefully get him to calm down a bit so I could work out an excuse to drop him off early at the next town. I asked him simply what his star sign was, and I told him I was a Leo. He looked at me like I had just grown an extra head and started demanding that I let him out of the car right away. I kept asking him to calm down, but every time I said calm down, he would panic and yell back at me. You're one of them. You're one of them. Finally, I was able to pull off an exit and he opened the door, jumped out and ran straight back into a field. I was so flustered by the whole thing that I sped off without even thinking about the fact that I had all of his stuff back in my trunk. But that thought didn't occur to me until I was already in Chicago. I felt terrible and I didn't know what to do about any of it but my mom always said that if you find something that isn't yours, turn it in somewhere that it can be found. So I figured the police were the best bet for this situation. I stopped at the first police precinct I could find, and I took the stuff inside. I told them I had given a hitchhiker a ride, but he seemed a little crazy, and he took off, and he forgot all of his stuff in my car. They had a good laugh and asked me if I had learned my lesson about offering strangers rides. One officer even kind of half scolded me for taking such a dumb risk. I assured them that I would never pick up another one, and I've been true to my word on that ever since. But that is not where the story ends. 
A few weeks later, I was back at home in Ohio in my little apartment, but there was this loud knock on the door. When I answered, I was surprised to find two men in black suits asking to come inside to talk to me. I had a lot of questions about that hitchhiker and what he might have said to me before he took off running. I remembered what he said about the CIA trying to kill him for knowing too much, and these guys certainly seemed to be agents of some kind. So I bluffed my way through it, pretending that he had just been so crazy that I didn't understand a word of anything he said. So now it's been 20 years later, and I swear that I sometimes still see black vehicles with dark tinted windows driving slowly by my house. It's super freaky. I'm totally convinced that I too am now having tabs kept on me. And I honestly wonder if it's only a matter of time before I have my thumb in the air on a highway, trying to stay one step ahead of them. Hey Lilith, I'm really glad I found your channel because I feel like this is something I need to purge from my brain. The thing is, I know nobody around me would ever believe what I'm saying. You see, to start with, ever since I was a little kid, I've been afraid of bugs. Growing up in Pennsylvania, the cicadas that come out every couple of years make me basically bedridden. If I went outside and one of those things landed on me, I was screaming bloody murder. So, more on the bugs later. Anyway... My older sister, by about two years, goes to college down in West Virginia. I'm finally at that age now where she respected me enough to let me come down and visit her and her friends. Of course, I love that because a few of them are really cute and they tend to pay a lot of attention to me. It used to be a really good time, honestly, but now I can't step foot across the state border without going into a full-on panic attack. So I'm down there for the weekend about three months ago, just hanging out with her and her friends. If you're not from a rural area, you might not know what I mean, but we were all at this giant field party, just everybody hanging out by the edge of the woods. And it really isn't like me, but on this day, I was talkative as heck. I walked all around, met about a hundred people I'll never meet again, and was having a great time. But that all came to an end very quickly when my sister and her roommates invited me to walk with them further down the field. Yeah, remember how cute I said they were? Right. So we're all standing there and talking when all of a sudden, I begin to feel the most uncomfortable random anxiety. I don't know what it was exactly, but I could just tell that something was wrong. For starters, it was dark as hell out and the only way we could see around was with our phones. Not to mention that there was all this buzzing noise happening around us. Annoying as hell because, as I said, I'm not a big bug fan. Really not a big bug fan. So we decide that we will continue walking along, and the second we start to walk away, we all hear this gigantic, super loud buzzing sound. It was practically like a lawnmower was starting up next to us. On the edges of the field were just these thick forests, real tall trees and everything, and that's where the sound was coming from. So we all kind of whipped our heads around. Me, I'm over there having a heart attack because the first thing I thought of when I heard buzzing was that there was some kind of a swarm coming, or maybe a disrupted hive, but it wasn't that. No, not that at all. Crazy thing is that all of our fight or flight kind of turned into more of a stand and watch when we saw what we saw. We look around at the edge of the forest and we don't really catch a good look of anything at first until suddenly our friend Jen shrieks bloody murder. We didn't even get a chance to ask her what she saw because it was like she saw a ghost. She turned around and hauled herself as quickly as she could back to the party. And what gets me really is that nowadays when I bring it up with her or my sister, they insist that they didn't see anything. But that's a total lie, plain and simple. But the thing is that I can't even blame them for trying to convince themselves otherwise. Because what we saw, that was the freakiest thing I have ever laid my eyes on. So she runs off and her boyfriend chases behind her and the rest of us sort of glance around at each other because we're all too nervous to check out the spot that Jen was eyeing up before she ran. Eventually though, I turn my head to look and let me tell you, I will never be able to forget the image. The first thing that I noticed was the eyes. 
because I know for sure that I have never seen an animal, person, or creature with eyes like that. They were practically the size of basketballs. Gigantic, glowing, and bright red. Fire truck red. A really pure red that almost looked like it could be some kind of light. They looked absolutely unreal, or even worse, they looked disgustingly bug-like. But as I said, the eyes were just the first thing that I noticed. The next characteristic, which is obviously what made it stand out so much, was the fact that this thing, this entity, whatever, was only a few inches taller than I was, and it had wings that unfolded as we watched it. It was like it saw us. Now it's obvious why Jen screamed and ran. We just hear this buzzing, this insect-like clicking coming so loudly from the creature in front of us. We can see it making the noises, although it's hardly close enough for us to make out any distinct facial features. In fact, I'll be honest, I don't even know if the thing had a face. We were all frozen, fearful. We just stood in a staring match with the thing, and then, like a miracle, it flew away. It flapped its crazy human-like wings, and it flew deep into the forest. It was gone as fast as it came, and I still have no clue what the heck it was. I mean, I do have a tendency to overreact, but this was completely different. We all saw it, and we all felt the same way. I couldn't have made this up, made up the fear that we all felt about it. Anyway, now it's one of those things that we don't bring up anymore. But I will tell you this, that experience has caused me to be extra alert and cautious. And now I always remember to double check my locks at night. I'm definitely not taking any chances. So I don't know how this will all play out, but one thing is for sure, I'm still very terrified of bugs. Hi, my name is Brian. I live just outside of Port Gibson, Mississippi, and I wanted to tell my story about coming face to face with something in a remote area here. I grew up in Mississippi, close to Jackson, and I've always loved the lay of the land out here. There's a lot of history, and in the Port Gibson area, a lot of little waterways are scattered here and there. I moved to Port Gibson about three years ago with my friend Craig. We both took jobs at a factory out here, and we're sharing a second floor of a three-story house. About two years ago, Craig and I were working third shift. For anybody who doesn't know, that's basically overnight. We went in at 10 at night and were scheduled until 6 in the morning, but we could leave earlier if our work got done and there was an overlap in shifts. On this night in August, there was, so we dipped out around 4.30 in the morning. Craig didn't have a car, so he always took my Pontiac to the factory. The house we lived in was in a rural part of Port Gibson, and we had to drive almost half an hour to the factory, along a road that wasn't exactly a highway, but close. It's considered a main road out here, and it runs from Port Gibson west towards the Mississippi River. In one area, it gets close to Bayou Pierre, a muddy river that has a lot of creeks running off of it. Craig and I were heading home, and because it was so early in the morning, it was still dark out. We had about half an hour until dawn, and I was driving with the headlights on. I've toned it down in the last few years, but back then, I used to rip around pretty good. And that's what we were doing on this road when it curved closer to the bayou and a creek that passed under the road. As we came around the corner, I saw something in the road and I laid on the brakes hard. My first thought was that someone had hit an alligator, which isn't super common, but it happens now and then, especially at night when they try to cross the roads. I slowed down and I squinted as we were coming up on it, but the shape looked wrong and Craig said out loud that it had to be a body. Unfortunately, bodies have been found in and around Bayou Pierre throughout the years. I got goosebumps thinking that we were about to see a dead body someone had dumped and wanted to hit the gas again, but the road was narrow here, and I didn't want to risk thumping over whatever it was. Slow down a bit, Craig said, leaning over the driver's side to see out my window better. The thing was on my side of the road and not moving. I told him, I think there's something wrong, because my brain could not make out what I was looking at. It didn't make any sense. 
and now that we were closer, it definitely looked like an alligator, but also like a human. In fact, I could see two legs twisted at odd angles out behind it, with bare feet limp on the asphalt. But the top half of the body is what didn't make sense. The head wasn't a human head, and it wasn't as large as an alligator's, but it shared the same shape with an elongated kind of a muzzle. Craig swore and pulled back, asking me if I saw the scales. I nodded. I couldn't speak. We were up next to the thing now, and my window was up. But I was still scared. Too scared to lean close and get a better look. But I did anyway, and I saw what looked like a messed-up science experiment. The bottom half of the body was human, with rough-looking skin. Dark in an odd way. And around where the hips started, we could see scales overlapping up on the torso and the trunk. The creature was lying on its stomach with its arms splayed out oddly. And again, I thought somebody had probably hit it. The face was facing away from us, but we could see the hairless head, ridges along the temple and upper cheek, and the protrusion of the snout-like thing. We pulled past it, and I kept looking in the rearview mirror, but it was so dark all we could really see was the shape. Do you think it came out of the river? Craig asked. I didn't see where else it could have come from. That section of the road is in the middle of nowhere, with no houses nearby. And it definitely looked like whatever that thing was, it had dragged itself out of the creek. Plus, it was naked. My knuckles were white as we drove back to the apartment, talking and trying to make sense of what we had seen. Craig brought up the head and the upper body first. I agreed that it looked reptilian, but too small to be an alligator. He then asked if I thought someone had done something messed up like sew a human and an alligator together. I admitted that I had considered that, but then I pointed out that the skin on the lower body didn't look like any regular human skin. We got back to the apartment and hurried inside, both of us weirded out by what we had seen. Over a quick breakfast of toast and bacon, both of us agreed that whatever it was had to be dead. It hadn't moved at all. We stayed up to watch the morning news, expecting it to be reported. This was two hours later, so we figured somebody must have come across it by now. But there were no stories about a reptilian body found. Craig went to bed. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. Later that day, and for the next few days, we kept checking the news. The body never came up. I have no idea what could have happened to it. Maybe it was actually alive and we just hadn't noticed? Or maybe somebody removed it from the road? Over the years, I've come to the conclusion that we either saw a lizard-man hybrid, or like I said, some kind of a sick experiment. Whatever it was, we haven't seen anything like that again. Nowadays, Craig has his own car and still works at the factory. But I got a job in town, and thankfully... I don't drive out on that road, often. I've lived in New Mexico my whole life. We see strange things on a daily basis. It isn't unusual for us, I guess. If you're a New Mexico native, you grow up hearing all sorts of bizarre stories. But these stories are real to those of us who have experienced them. They aren't stories that have been made up. And on top of that, New Mexico has a lot of underlying superstition. It's as if the place was made of it. If you talk to any of the Apaches or Navajo, or just anyone who has had a long family tie to the state, they will all tell you a similar story. You can ask them about the lights in the sky, and they will all usually just nod their heads. They've known about the lights, they've seen the lights, and they've all just accepted them as part of the world. I guess I'm more of a skeptic. Yes, I know of a lot of unusual happenings, but I'm also a firm believer in science and facts. So when I moved into the house across from a New Mexico Air Force base, I guess I didn't realize the activity that I'd be exposing myself and my children to. We'd lived in my home for a few years before anything really started to happen. Of course, we'd see different aircrafts leave at night, but usually only during the night. But one night late at night, sometime in June, we started hearing unusual noises coming from the base. They were loud. So loud. They woke up the whole household. Really, they reminded me of a type of doomsday siren you would hear in a movie. 
At first I was scared because I wasn't sure if it was some type of siren to get us to evacuate. But when I noticed all of my surrounding neighbors were out on their porches pointing toward the sky, I realized it was something more bizarre. In the sky were these strange orbs. They didn't move like a plane or a helicopter. They actually seemed to weave and dance with each other. It was weird. But soon the orbs vanished, lasted maybe two minutes, and the noise stopped too. I see all my neighbors going inside, and none of them are really talking to each other, and I didn't know any of them well enough to start a conversation about what had happened. So we went inside too. The next morning I had a terrible, painful headache, so did the rest of my family. I called into work because I couldn't even function. The lights hurt my eyes, and so did sounds, like a migraine. A few weeks passed, and then we heard the noise again, but this time it sounded like a low hum. I peeked out the window, and the neighbors were all inside, it seemed. So I looked up at the sky, and I could see those orbs again, but they seemed further away. That next morning, I had another headache, and it was painful, but not nearly as bad as the time prior. Weeks would pass in between the events, but we all started to get used to it. Even the headaches became a normal part of our lives. I know, it was strange. But just as we started to get used to these things, we started to experience other stuff. One night we heard this noise, and one of my kids came into my room complaining about this weird tapping noise coming from the backyard. I told them that I would check if they promised that they'd go to sleep right after. They agreed. So I went to the back door and I opened it. I looked around the porch, but I didn't see anything unusual. So I went back inside and instructed them to go back to sleep. The next day, again, I wasn't feeling well. Yes, I had a headache, but I also was just very fatigued and weak. I thought I might be getting a cold, so I stayed home from work. I was going around the house picking things up. My kids had left a bunch of toys in our living room, so I went into their room to put it all away. Obviously, the room wasn't in any better condition, so I started grabbing dirty socks and clothes from the floor and I opened their curtains to let the light in. But as soon as I pulled the curtains open, I noticed that there was the shape of a hand on their window. We do get a lot of sandstorms, so the handprint looked like it was left on the outside of the window, but the window was almost completely absent of dirt, almost as if the hand had wiped it away. To be sure, I wiped the glass with my finger. Handprint was definitely on the outside. But the thing that really bothered me about the handprint was that the palm was very tiny, but the fingers were long and thin. I thought maybe my kids had been in the backyard and wanted to scare me by creating the strange handprint, so I guess I didn't let it bother me too much. But I went ahead, and I looked outside once again. I walked over to their window, and I could see the handprint from outside now. And underneath the handprint, I saw more handprints all along the windowsill. And below that, I saw what looked like two feet imprinted in the dirt. It was clear that somebody had been standing at the window, but the feet were small, like the size of my kids. However, the shape did not appear to be normal. I'll be honest, the dirt seemed to have been disturbed. The footprints weren't very clear, but they looked more like handprints than footprints. The sole seemed longer than the palm, but the toes were long, just like the handprint on the window. Who knows? Maybe they were just more handprints in the dirt. But again, the placement of everything seemed a bit too elaborate for my kids, and that's when I started to feel a little uncomfortable. Seeing the bizarre traces of someone or something outside my kids' room did not make me feel very good about the stories I had heard growing up, even if I was a skeptic. Anyway, we still experience strange things to this day. Even the strange handprints left after nights of odd activities at the Air Force Base. So who knows what's going on? I can only hope for the best. This story happened a few weeks ago in, of all places, New York City. And I haven't had a good night's sleep since. I was friends with a group of three guys who liked to identify themselves as urban explorers. They would root out abandoned warehouses and factories, open manholes, and walk through the subway tunnels. They didn't have any real goal that I was aware of. I guess they just liked the sense of adventure. 
I had listened to a bunch of their stories, and I asked if I could join them on their next excursion, to which they agreed. I'm not sure why I did it, and I would later come to completely regret it. We had decided to explore a little stretch of abandoned warehouses on the outskirts of one of the burrows. I'm not going to give specifics. I don't want to be responsible for anybody else getting hurt. The night came. I caught the bus, and I met them about half-hour walk away. These guys traveled light, just some headlamps and flashlights, though one guy actually had a crowbar. The property around the building was fenced off, but it must have been ages since anyone had come to inspect it. There were plenty of openings we could slip through and even found a spot that looked like it was completely torn open. There was lots of graffiti and litter all over the place, but we didn't see anybody else. We headed to the closest warehouse, a five-story brick building with all of the windows smashed in or missing. There wasn't even a door, so we were able to walk right in. Honestly, it was pretty underwhelming. I guess it was cool for the first few minutes, almost like walking through a little piece of recent history. But after you've seen one empty and dusty room, you've seen them all. In one of the rooms, we found a few garbage bags filled with odds and ends and a few blankets. Probably some poor guy who was down on his luck and sleeping there, but again, there wasn't anybody around. We walked all around the building, going all the way to the roof. The view was nice, but I was ready to just leave and call it a night. But once we got back to the main floor, we found a door that we must have missed the first time. It wasn't locked, but it was wedged pretty tight. We all took turns trying to pry it open unsuccessfully, until Crowbar Guy earned his name and propped it open. It was pitch black, but we had our headlamps and we could see that it was a flight of stairs that led straight down. There was also this odd, slightly rotten smell coming from down there. I felt a little uneasy now, but this was the kind of stuff these guys lived for. They didn't hesitate, and they just started walking down the stairs. I didn't want to wait up here by myself, so I followed. The staircase went on for longer than I expected, and by the time it leveled off, I couldn't even tell how far we had come. The smell was much more intense now, and I actually had to take my beanie off and hold it over my nose and my mouth, which didn't really help. And it was obvious that this place was pretty much untouched since being abandoned. There were a bunch of desks and chairs, along with stacks upon stacks of paperwork and random supplies. The basement was roughly the size of the main floor, making it pretty expansive. I had this really bad feeling, but the other guys weren't hearing it. And as we went deeper, the smell became almost unbearable. Eventually, we came to the widest part we had found yet. And what we saw made me sick to my stomach. A body. A human body was lying on the floor in the middle of the room. Hunched over, it was something I can't logically explain. It had pale gray flesh, almost white. Its hands were inside of the body, moving around like they were searching for something. It didn't have an ear or a nose that I could see, only a pair of bloodshot red eyes that latched onto us as soon as it saw us. Everything stopped for a few seconds, my group and the creature just staring at each other. That's when I turned and I threw up. It just happened. I don't know if it was the sight in front of me, the smell, or the pure fear, but I just puked all over the floor. My sudden movement and the noise must have startled the beast because a moment later it was standing straight up, its head almost touching the eight-foot-high ceilings. One of the guys started yelling and I felt a hand grab me from behind and pull me around. We all started running. The thing let out a terrible scream behind us like it was trying to yell with fluid in its mouth. It must have been chasing us because a few times I could hear slamming noises coming from behind, like it was kicking the furniture out of the way. But I didn't dare look back. We made it to the bottom of the stairs, and I was the last one in the group. Just as I ducked under the doorframe, something slammed into the wall beside my head. I don't know what it was, but it made a wet thud as it impacted. I raced up through the door onto the main floor, and one of the guys was waiting to slam the door behind me. I just kept running out into the yard and everybody caught up a moment later. We all ran to the fence line, ducked through a hole, and then only decided to look back then. There was no sign of the creature. When we all took a moment to calm down, we started talking about what we had just seen and what we should do next. None of us even had an inkling what that thing was, 
but we all could agree that it was not a human. I said that we needed to go to the police, that somebody had died in that building. But one of the other guys said, no, man, think about it. Think how that would look. Were we really going to go to the police and tell them that some kind of monster was eating a homeless person in the basement of an abandoned building? Even if they believed us and went to the building, what would happen? If they found the body, would they think it was us? We weren't even supposed to be there in the first place. I'm ashamed to admit it, but he was right. So we didn't go to the police and we didn't tell anybody. I didn't really see these guys too much after this incident. And as far as I know, that was the end of their urban explorations. I know it sounds crazy. It is crazy. But it happened just like I told it. Stay out of places like this. God only knows what else lurks in the dark corners and the basements of civilization. Hi, and thanks for featuring my story on your channel. People have been telling their encounters like this where I come from for years and years. And I'm glad that mine's finally going to get some recognition. People where I come from are very familiar with this sort of thing. And I just want other people to know that we are not crazy. We've all seen it. My dad used to tell us stories about it even. He was a God-fearing man, not one to joke about evil and the devil. And that's why I always believed in it growing up. My dad even joined a posse once to try and hunt the devil down in the swamps and the pinelands. The posse was unsuccessful, obviously, since I've seen it myself all these many years later. So here's my story. I live in New Jersey, and I was on a hike with my dog out in the Pinelands. I've been retired for a few years now, and this is one of my main pastimes. I like to go out pretty far, away from other people so that I can keep the dog off leash. He likes it better that way, and so do I. So we were walking out there, and it all seemed pretty normal. I was admiring the trees because it was fall and the colors were in full show. I've been thinking that I wish I could get myself back there again, but the truth is, I'm too scared that I'll run into it again. I know there was a waterfall somewhere on this trail, and I was looking for the turnoff to go see that. My dog was probably 50 feet or so ahead of me, close enough that I could call him and that he would come running back. And as I was walking, I noticed this strange smell in the air. I know the dog noticed it too because he stopped and stuck his nose up and was sniffing the air. I felt it smelled like sulfur. Now, like I said, I grew up hearing all these stories. People always talked about this rotten egg smell. I hadn't thought about it before coming hiking out this far, but I realized that I could be deep in its territory. I mean, I knew I was pretty far out from civilization. The dog noticed the smell too. I knew because he kept holding his head in the air and sniffing, and it seemed like he was acting really freaked out. He turned around at one point and came back to me and then stuck by my side. Didn't bark or anything, just stuck his tail between his legs and hung close. All signs were pointing to the fact that I was about to encounter something I had avoided for my whole life, and I was perfectly happy being one of the residents of this area who hadn't encountered it. I turned myself around... My dog followed, and we started heading back towards the car. I knew that it was a mile or two back, and it was trying to move fast. But of course, I'm old and retired, and I can only go so fast. I was really trying to get back to the car as fast as I could, though. I never ran because I had seen on TV that you shouldn't run away from a tiger. If you run, that'll just snap its instinct into chasing you. I figured that the same logic would probably apply here. The rotten egg smell never let up the entire time, which made me sure that this thing was following me. So I was moving as fast as I could. I was absolutely terrified. There were stories of this thing breaking into barns and killing goats and chickens. I figured it could take me out too if it was hungry enough. And then the rotten smell got really strong for a minute. And that was when I knew it was probably right behind me. I was terrified, but I had heard the stories and I knew what to expect. I had to face the devil head on. I turned around and I didn't see anything at first. I darted my gaze around, trying to figure out where this thing really was. And then I saw it. It stepped out from behind a tree into my full view. It really was a devil, 
some sort of an evil creature spawned from hell. My heart hammered so hard because of terror and disbelief. If I wasn't positive I was about to be murdered by the thing, I probably would have been worried about having a heart attack. It was tall, probably six feet plus, and it had two large wings, like the kind you would see on a gargoyle in a European cathedral. I don't really remember what its body or legs looked like. I was focused on those wings. I really remember its head, too. It had a goat's head with red eyes and these disturbing square pupils. It never advanced on me. I don't know why. I was sure my life was about to end right there. It just looked at me as I backed away from it. Thank God the dog never barked. He was scared, too. If the dog had barked, I'm sure it would have attacked, and that would have been the end of us. We did make it back to the car and back home. I haven't been able to go walking in the woods ever since. In fact, I just go on short little hikes around the neighborhood now, safely within the highly populated areas. That thing haunts me in my sleep. Sometimes I close my eyes and I see those red eyes with their terrifying horizontal pupils. I don't know if I'll ever be able to go walking in the woods again. I've only told a few close people about my encounter. Just the older generation who knows that this creature is part of the countryside. I hate that I saw it. I hope that everybody who hears this story will be luckier than I was. I'm sending this in anonymously. You'll understand why after hearing the story. Earlier this year, I moved to New Mexico. I'm originally from Philadelphia, and moving out west was a huge culture shock. Between the sheer emptiness of the place and the long drives, I almost felt like I was in another country. I had moved in with my aunt, who lived alone. She was getting older and was finding it hard to take care of herself after my uncle passed. And since I didn't really have much going on back home... I volunteered to go out to stay with her for a while and just help with things around the house. I worked remotely anyway. I love my aunt and the little town she lives in is beautiful and the locals are all extremely nice. Nothing like back home. But it was boring for me because I didn't know anybody. I mean, how much Netflix can you possibly watch? So, looking for something to do, I did the logical thing and I made a Tinder profile. I matched with a few different girls, and some of them were nice enough, but they all lived pretty far away. Eventually, I met this cute girl named Emily, and we really started hitting it off. But she lived 90 minutes away in Santa Fe, which, by New Mexico standards, was right down the road. A few days later, I ended up driving out to meet her for a date, and we had a great time. We both wanted to see each other again, so I made plans to come back the following Friday. Little did I know that that Friday night would be the most terrifying night of my life. The roads out west are dark. And I don't mean dim or kind of hard to see. I mean pitch black, can't see jack, dark. I was sort of getting used to it, but it still kind of bugged me out. Anyway, Emily had to work until 8 p.m., so I planned to pick her up from the house at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, I was kind of banking on her letting me stay over since I didn't want to drive home at 3 a.m., so I'd been driving for about 45 minutes, and I had only passed two other cars on the road. And the last one had been 20 minutes prior. So then I was fiddling with the radio trying to find a station, and I subconsciously slowed the car down quite a bit. And that's what probably saved the guy's life. At least, initially. I just happened to glance up, and at the last second, I saw somebody frantically waving their arms in the middle of the road, right in front of my car. I slammed on my brakes, but it was too late and I simultaneously felt and heard the impact. Luckily, they were off to the side a bit, but the person was still hurled back about 10 feet away, and my car made this horrific screeching noise as I came to a stop. Now my Jeep is pretty old and didn't have airbags, but luckily my seatbelt stopped me from slamming my head on the wheel. After a second, I came to the realization that I had just hit somebody. I was shaking so badly that it took me a few seconds to unclip my seatbelt, but when I did... I opened the car and I ran outside to the body laying in the road. It was a young guy, probably early 20s or so. He wasn't wearing a shirt and his jeans were all torn up and he was missing a shoe. As far as I could tell, he was unconscious, but breathing. I ran back to the car to get my cell phone, but of course you don't get service here because I was literally in the desert. I wasn't sure what to do at this point, so I just went back to the guy and crouched down next to him. 
I got a good look at him at this point and realized he was very unhealthy looking, emaciated, and sort of sick looking. I sat there for another minute or so weighing my options, which is when I heard something coming out of the darkness on the side of the road. It sounded like a growl, a growl that a house dog would make, only it was throatier, almost like a choking or gargling sound. I don't have the words to really explain it, but it wasn't a noise I had ever heard any living creature make. Trying to convince myself it was a coyote or something, I grabbed the guy under the armpits and I started dragging him back to my jeep. I was going to put him in the passenger seat and just drive to the hospital in Santa Fe or flag somebody down for help if I got the chance. When I got to the passenger side of the car, I realized the door was locked. Luckily, I was driving with my window down, so I laid the guy down gently and I walked around to the other side and unlocked the door. I walked to the trunk of my Jeep thinking maybe I had some clothes or something to cover him up with. At least I could try to make him comfortable. But not finding anything useful, I closed the trunk and I walked back to the passenger side. The guy was now sitting up. His shoulders were pumping up and down rapidly though, almost like he was hyperventilating. I was behind him, but it seemed like he was staring at something straight ahead, right where the headlights were pointing. I looked up. This thing was standing in the dead center of the road. It was on all fours, but its hind legs were twice as long as its front, giving it this weird sloping angle. It had this row of needle-thin quills running up its spine, each about a foot long, it seemed like. It was salivating something vicious and black, Steam was rising from the pavement where it dripped in thick clumps. Even hunched down the way it was, it still had to be taller than my six foot one. The three of us were completely still at this point, almost like we were waiting for the other to act. The guy decided it would be him. He let out a scream that seemed like it filled the entire desert. I don't know how he did it, but one second he was sitting down, and the next he was sprinting off down the road into the darkness. The creature opened its mouth impossibly wide, and then it let out its own scream, perfectly mimicking the tone and pitch that the guy had just made. I bolted for the back of the jeep. I felt something hard slam into the hood, and I just stood crouched in the silence. I waited a few minutes, the whole time hearing the guy screaming repeatedly, but getting farther and farther away. I couldn't see the guy or the creature. My heart was pounding, and I was trying not to throw up. After a few minutes, I stood up, looked through the rear view windshield, and I didn't see anything. So I crept up along the side of my car, got to the door, and quietly opened it. And that's when I heard the same scream again, this time right behind me. One hand on the door, I pulled it open, jumped in the car, and shut it behind me. Something hard hit the side of my Jeep, and for a split second, I thought it was going to tip. I never turned the car off, luckily, so I just reached down and pushed down on the gas. Of course, the car was in park, the engine just strained like it was about to burst, so I reached up with my hand, shifted into drive, and the car leapt forward. I drove about 50 feet, shifted myself so that I was sitting properly, and then kept on driving. I left the guy out there in the desert, alone with that thing. I'm ashamed. I can't be certain, but there's a good chance that the guy is dead, and I'm partly, if not totally, to blame. I never went to see Emily that night. I drove till I hit an intersection and just ended up taking the long way back to my aunt's. I know that I'm a horrible person. Now this is partly a confession and partly a warning. A warning that there is something unnatural living and hunting out in the desert of New Mexico. In the mid-2000s, I was attending college at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Growing up in Iowa, I had always wanted to find a way to be closer to the ocean. So I loved the location, and I figured I'd get plenty of time to explore. But then I always felt so overwhelmed with studying and assignments, and it ended up that I seemed to spend most of my time inside. Anyway, my roommate Amanda and I decided to abandon our schoolwork one weekend and finally go have an adventure. We decided to go to Assateague Island. It's a barrier island and a refuge for a lot of different wildlife. I was most excited to check out the feral ponies that I had heard about. There don't really seem to be many places where you can see wild horses anymore. So we decided to camp even though it was the off-season and would be pretty chilly. At least there were no crowds. So we borrowed a bunch of gear from our hardcore camping friend and we headed out. 
We stopped at the visitor center and the rangers told us where we would be likely to see the horses. They told us to just make sure we put away all of our food items whenever we were away from the campsite. We showed them the bear-proof cooler we had borrowed and they said that was fine. We set up our camping spot and we went to the recommended trail. And when we were out there, we caught sight of horses off in the distance. They had told us to stay at least 40 feet away from them, but we were able to get a good look. We were happy to get a not too distant view of horses across an inlet but then we were really excited when the herd stormed through the water and toward the area where we were standing. There must have been three different herds while we were hiking around that morning. We had some binoculars so we could spot them in the distance, and then we were satisfied with our sightings by noon. We took the rest of the day to have a cookout and just relax on the beach. I was ready for bed early, and I got in my sleeping bag right after sunset with my book. I must have fallen asleep right away, and the next thing that I knew... I was woken by something howling. Now I'm familiar with coyotes and wolves, but this did not sound like that. It was higher and screechier, and it gave me goosebumps all over. And I could have sworn it was getting closer. I convinced myself it must be one of the island foxes. So I just fell asleep again, but then this horrible growling woke me up again. It was a really low growl and guttural and rumbling. I could hear something rustling outside the tent, and it was probably half an hour before the noises stopped and I could sleep again. The next day, we decided to take the wildlife loop trail. It was maybe three miles long, and it gave good views of the marsh and the forest. We ended up staying out there a long time, exploring. And by the time we decided to head back to camp, we were both pretty tired, and it was almost sunset again. We came over the crest of a dune and could see our tent a ways away. It looked like it was fluttering in the wind, more than it should be. I could tell there was some stuff on the ground by the tent, and I remember saying how weird that was. And then as we got closer, we could see that the tent door was hanging unzipped and flapping around. The stuff on the ground was a bunch of our stuff, our sleeping bags, and clothes. I mean, what the heck? We were thinking somebody had robbed us. We knew we hadn't left any food unsecured, and it didn't seem like the work of an animal because the zippers were just pulled down like a person would do. Inside the tent, there were big, muddy prints all over the floor. If I didn't know better, I would have thought they were from a giant dog. Our bags had been opened and all of the contents had been removed and thrown around. All the food that had been securely locked inside the cooler was gone, and everything was covered with sand and mud. We were totally mystified. And then I heard that growl that I had heard in the night before. I was instantly petrified. I can't tell you how primal it sounded. Amanda and I rushed out and we heard it coming towards us then from the trees. We both screamed when we saw this huge werewolf looking creature. It was obviously eating something and it looked like a six or seven foot tall wolf, but it had the torso of a man. It had a long snout and sharp fangs and when it howled, it sounded a lot like a human scream. It was facing sideways to us, so I couldn't really see its eyes, but its back was kind of hunched and it had massive shoulders. It never looked toward us. It seemed to finish what it was eating and then turned away and went into the trees. We were literally shaken from the shock of seeing that thing. We knew we had to leave. We pulled everything out of the tent and shook it off as best as we could, and we threw everything in the trunk. We raced out of there and we did stop at the ranger station, but it was after hours and we couldn't see anybody around. We didn't know what to do. We ended up just going home and called them the next day to describe what we had seen. I have no idea if they took us seriously or if they thought we were just seeing things. In any case, if any of your listeners have any idea what the heck was going on there, please write in and let us know. It really messed up our heads. And it started out as a great trip. I've lived on the same block all my life, just outside of Lincoln, Nebraska. My family and I were always super welcoming to new neighbors, and we've had many families move away and new ones move in over the years. However, the house at the end of our block had sat empty for a few months until one day I saw a young man doing things around the yard in the evening. 
I'd usually take our dog for a walk around the block, and I figured I'd make my way over to say hello. I strolled over, and I let out a neighborly hey. He perked up his head and greeted me and my dog. I conversed with him for a bit and came to find out his name was Brian, and he was only 22. I thought it was odd for a homeowner to live alone at that age. Given that he was only 22, though, he had extremely good manners and appeared to be a well-put-together gentleman. He told me he had just come back from serving overseas, and then he went on about how he got injured in the field of duty, so his time was cut short and he was sent home. I congratulated him on his return and I waved goodbye for the night. The next day was Saturday and so I thought to myself, why don't I bake some cookies and take them over? When morning came, I did just that and then headed to his house around noon. I knocked a few times, but there was no answer at the door. Not thinking much of it, I figured I would catch him later on in the day when I took the dog for a walk again. Throughout the day, I did work around the house a bit, played around in the garden, and eventually nighttime rolled around like clockwork. So that's when I took the dog for a walk, promptly at six. The sun was disappearing behind the clouds and dusk was settling in. As I approached, it was almost like he knew I was coming because I saw the light turn on and he stepped outside on his porch and waved me over. I smiled and greeted to him as I got closer. I told him I had come by earlier, but I must have missed him. He didn't acknowledge it, but instead he just petted my dog and went on to tell me that he had a dog abroad that looked similar to mine. He seemed at ease, and we kept talking for a while on the porch. I asked him what it was like abroad, and he let out a small sigh. Feeling I had overstepped, I apologized, and I tried to change the subject. But he continued, and he said, It was traumatizing. You see things you should never see. I sensed him growing emotional the more he told me. He continued on, saying he had lost one of his childhood friends and that that had been the hardest. We'd grown up together and enlisted together when we turned of age, he said. He continued telling me that it was the summer of 41, and even though he continued talking, my brain was stuck on him saying 41. Was it possible he had a brain fart and meant 22? Not wanting to be rude, I let him continue on talking. By the time my brain focused on what he was now saying, I was starting to piece together some stuff. He mentioned war bonds and told me he worked alongside a juice jerker. My grandfather had served in World War II, and I remember he had used that term before too, but I never knew what it meant. By the time we wrapped up talking, I had so many questions, but none I could openly ask him, comfortably anyway. I thanked him for the visits and made my way home for the night. Immediately, I went to my laptop, and I began looking up the term juice jerker. I came to find out that it was a term to describe electricians back in the day. Things started to click. I wanted to know more, and I couldn't wait until the following morning. I'd studied more about the war that night and learned more about it than I ever did in school. I even dug through our family photos in search of a picture of my grandfather when he served. Maybe I wasn't thinking straight but I was starting to believe that whoever he was may have been from that time period. I mean, the math didn't add up, of course, but his dialect and knowledge about the war was on point. The next day came. I had a few errands to run. I was in a hurry all that day, and by the time I got home, it was around four o'clock. So I figured I'd clean up and maybe head over again when the night fell. I would have done just that, too. But when I glanced down the street at one point, I saw somebody hammering a for sale sign in the yard. I approached the lady, trying to help her, saying, I think you have the wrong house. She frowned and glanced at her clipboard and said, No, this is the right one. But I pressed on. No, I'm sure I met the man who bought this house a few days ago. She paused and looked at me as if I was crazy. She went on to tell me that the home hadn't been purchased. She said, Somebody seemed to have taken down the original for sale sign, but assured me that it was still for sale and then she got into her car and drove off. I glanced at the home in shock and went knocking on the door, still believing that there was some misunderstanding. For nearly 10 minutes, I stayed knocking and looking through the windows. There was no sign of him anywhere. As the days went on, I never saw him again. I was puzzled, but most of all sad that I never got to know more about him or what happened to him. My dad then caught me sulking over a picture of my grandfather with a few of his friends while in the army. 
I hadn't looked at the picture too much before, but I noticed one of the men looked just like the man I met at the house, just like Brian. I found myself sitting there with my finger on the photo, pointing at him and thinking. And as my dad walked by, he said, Oh yeah, that's Brian. He was a good friend of your grandpa. I was in shock, but it now all made sense. I didn't tell my dad right then, but I instantly knew that I had met my grandpa's childhood friend. Hi Lilith. After listening to some of the paranormal stories on your channel, I thought I would contribute one of my own that happened a couple of years ago. I ran into some hard times when COVID hit. I ended up losing my job because our business had to close and I didn't have much savings built up. I was living in upstate New York at the time and had really been enjoying my independence, but then it was like everything just changed almost overnight. My uncle flipped houses professionally and he had purchased some cheap property in an old suburb up there. He was willing to let me move in for free while it was being worked on. The house was pretty run down, but it did have an extra bedroom that wasn't in the worst shape and it had heating and running water, so I moved in and lived on the ground floor with my two cats. Things went along pretty okay for a few months. I didn't know exactly why, but one day these two stray cats started hanging out around my porch. I don't know if my cats attracted them or what. I didn't discourage them at all, I never left food outside, and I kept trying to shoo them away. But they both would just look me in the eye and ignore my shooing and act like they just belonged there. I guess I'm weak when it comes to cats, though, because I'll admit that it wasn't long before I had four cats living inside with me. However, right after they moved in, things started getting really weird in the house. I would start hearing strange noises at night, and things would go missing, like pieces of my jewelry. Like I would take off my rings and earrings at night, but then one piece wouldn't be there in the morning, but then that piece would reappear later in the day, making me think I was going crazy. I admit I'm kind of an absent-minded person, so it's not that unusual for me to move stuff and then forget where I put it, but it really felt like it was a lot of things. And then after a month or so, the cats started acting peculiar too. They would gather and hiss at the door to the basement. All four of them. One time in the middle of the night, they started yowling so loudly that it woke me up. I went down to check on things, but they all just scattered. So figuring I would get to the bottom of it, I opened the basement door and I headed down to check it out. I got to the bottom of the stairs, but it just looked like a normal, creepy basement to me. And then it got worse. The cats started doing this every single night. They would gather and start hissing and yowling at the basement door. I started thinking maybe there were rats in the basement or something. I didn't know. I told my uncle about it, and he called in an exterminator to lay down poison and traps. And when the exterminator finished, he made a comment about how it was important to keep the cats out of the basement. When he said that, it occurred to me that not once had any of the four cats crossed over the basement threshold, even though the door was open on a fairly regular basis. One day, I was in the kitchen doing the dishes, and my uncle was upstairs working on house repairs. Then I heard him walk across the creaky floor up there, and then I heard him break into a full run down the stairs to the first floor and towards the basement door. I assumed he went into the basement because I heard the door slam with so much force that it scared me and I almost dropped the dish I was washing. I then walked over toward the basement door to see what had made him run. I opened it and yelled down at him for being such a bozo. But that's when I heard a noise behind me and I spun around to see my uncle coming down from upstairs asking me what all the commotion was about. Oh my gosh, was it not him that had just gone down in the basement, I thought? We were the only two in the house. When I realized that he had been upstairs the whole time, my blood ran ice cold. I told him that somebody had run down the stairs and had slammed the door shut to the basement. He went down there to look, but he didn't find anything. So now I was feeling super uncomfortable about living in the house. I mean, the cat sounds at night were getting nuts, and I was so sleep-deprived. I honestly started hallucinating. I went downstairs one night to shush the cats once again, and I imagined that I saw this old woman standing in front of the basement door wagging her finger at them. Then they really started yowling. 
Everything was making me crazy. All of the changes that the pandemic had caused, my stress over losing my job, these weird living arrangements. I was really over it. A week or two later, I made the hard decision to move back home with my parents in Connecticut. My uncle decided to sell the property to some developers. Apparently, none of the repairs were going right. So when he was selling it, he came across some information about an old woman who had lived there alone with her cats for years. The information told him that she was found dead in the basement one day. It seemed she had died when she fell down the stairs. And there was a creepy rumor that when the cats found her, they might have chewed on some of her body parts. I can't even really talk about it. That totally grosses me out. And it makes me wonder if the two stray cats were associated with her. Well, I couldn't take all four cats back to my parents, but fortunately we found somebody willing to adopt them. At least the two that showed up at the house. I always get chills when I think about that story, and my uncle, who's a big, strong guy, seemed pretty creeped out. And you could tell that he was relieved to have sold the property. He's always been a very reasonable and not superstitious guy. And I never paid much attention to that kind of stuff either. But now, neither one of us knows what to believe. It was 1992, and I had moved to New York with dreams of becoming a high-profile copyright lawyer. It was something I'd planned for extensively, and both my parents were on board 100%. But that was my plan before I moved to the city. I quickly fell in with a group of regular partygoers. Well, more like ravers. I had no experience whatsoever engaging in that type of life, I was from the Midwest, so I was completely out of my element, and I was only in my mid-twenties. But that's sort of what excited me. I was in the greatest city in the world, and I was trying things for the first time in my life. I started reconsidering my life plans, questioning why I had ever wanted to set myself up for a life so serious and so professional. Because the truth was, I was having more fun than I'd ever had in my life. My new friends had grown up in the city, so they were really familiar with the club scene and had a lot of connections in the area. They took me to a new place every weekend where we would dress up in clothing I would never wear in front of my parents, and we would dance the night away until the early morning hours sent us back home to our shoebox apartments. Of course, my parents did not, could not know what I was up to in New York. I was terrified that they would disown me if they knew the truth about my shifting ambitions. One night, we ended up at a massive warehouse in Brooklyn. There was a DJ there that my friend was interested in, so we did what we had to do to get in. I didn't feel good about that. I had a pretty straight-edge upbringing, and my morals were pretty tight. But like a lot of the things I once felt certain about, my mindset was changing. I was having a great time dancing and socializing with my friends, and I eventually started talking to this guy that I thought was cute. We were chatting and dancing together for a few hours until the people in charge of the rave turned the lights on, signaling that the party was over. I looked around for my friend who I'd come with, but I couldn't find her. I waited by the venue's doors for as long as I could, but the security guards eventually kicked me out, and my friend was still nowhere to be found. Outside, most of the other attendees had already left, and it dawned on me that it was very late, and I was in a different part of town than I was used to. I didn't want to wait outside this warehouse by myself for what could be hours, unprotected, so I started making my way toward the train. I would call the venue in the morning and just go from there. The train wasn't far, but at that time of night, it sure felt like it. There were so few people on the street at that hour, and those who were didn't seem too friendly. The train platform was equally unsetting. There was an old man walking shirtless in circles, two inebriated women way down at the end, and me. I silently thanked my stars when the train finally pulled up. I got into an empty train car. I had a little bit of a ride ahead of me, but I was just happy to be safe and inside. But then, the doors connecting my car to the next opened and this dark figure emerged. It wasn't an MTA worker, it was like a really tall, old-timey businessman with a trench coat and a bowler hat. I looked down at my outfit and I cringed, avoiding eye contact with the stranger. 
the stranger had entered at the far opposite end of the car and then continued walking in my direction. I figured they were going to continue their passage into the next car, but as soon as they reached me, they sat and stopped directly across from me on the train. I tried to ignore them, but I could see them staring straight at me. And obviously it made me uncomfortable, and I slyly grabbed the bottle of mace that my parents made me keep on hand. I didn't pull it out, I just held it inside my bag. And then finally, I looked up at the person. They were smiling, widely, too widely. Their eyes were expressionless, though. If you covered the lower half of the face, you wouldn't even be able to tell they were smiling. But what struck me immediately was the absence of a nose. I impolitely stared, trying to understand what was sitting in front of me. But the stranger's smile just got wider in unfiltered delight. It was unkind, sort of taunting. I stood up involuntarily, needing to sit somewhere else, or maybe get off at the next stop, or even just relocate to a different train car. But as soon as I did this, the stranger mirrored me. They stood several feet taller than me, and now was only feet away. Just as the train began to slow down, I froze as the stranger's hand rose in front of its face. I didn't know what to think until it touched the brim of its hat and tipped it toward me. But what I realized is there weren't any hands or a wrist. And the more I looked at it, I realized why it was wearing the trench coat. The hem of the coat didn't quite reach the floor, revealing the absence of feet and legs. This thing was just a face, I realized, and the garments were seemingly floating in midair. The train screeched to a halt and that smile just grew wider before the figure spun around in the air and floated off of the train. I couldn't move, not until the train started up again and lurched forward, making me lose my balance. Now, I don't know who or what I saw that night on the train, but I wasn't going to be riding alone after midnight anymore. And maybe I would ease up on the raves. And, just maybe, I would stick with my initial plans for college. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. I saw something when I was 11 years old and I have been scared to look in the mirror ever since. The Conjuring came out in 2013 and it was somewhat of a cultural phenomenon. I mean, maybe it was just because I was in middle school, but it seemed as though that was all anybody was talking about. Growing up, my parents were the most strict of all of my friends. This meant monitoring internet access, limiting late-night outings, and certainly no R-rated movies. So you can only imagine 11-year-old me and my excitement to have gotten the green light to stay the night at my friend Lisa's house, one fall night for a Halloween party. I showed up to the party sporting my best Harry Potter attire and everybody else's costumes looked equally amazing. We carved pumpkins, danced to the Monster Mash, and ate way too much candy. When it came time for lights out, we all huddled in the basement, pulled out our pillows and blankets, and made ourselves cozy. The slumber party portion of the night operated just like you would expect, considering it consisted of seven or so middle school girls. We had pizza and soda, gossiped, painted each other's nails, and talked about the cutest boys in our grade. That was, until Lisa's older brother, Skylar, came downstairs with two of his friends and suggested we all watch a movie. Despite Skylar being only a year older than Lisa and all of us girls, it felt as though he and his friends were worlds apart. That's why it came as no surprise that one of the boys had a pirated copy of The Conjuring, and he insisted it would be the perfect movie to watch at a Halloween party. Even though I didn't really like scary movies, I was not going to be the one to suggest that we watch something else. Like I said, this movie was all the rage at the time, and I think all the girls knew that watching it and being able to talk about it at school would make the party even ten times cooler. Looking back, I wish my mom was there to put a stop to the whole thing, because there is no reason that I should still get goosebumps thinking about that night, nearly 15 years later. Now let me preface this by saying that Lisa's house was creepy as hell. The mere fact that we had to sleep in the basement should already have alluded to that. The house must have been built in a different century. The floors creaked as you walked around, the lights flickered at random times... 
There was a furnace in the basement, and the only plus side of sleeping down there is that it was the warmest place in the house. But really the worst part of all was the abundance of antique paintings and knickknacks scattered everywhere. I'm talking old porcelain dolls with cracks in the faces, armoires filled with vintage dishes and magazines, portraits of previous homeowners who must have been dead for ages. So yeah, it was the perfect place for a Halloween party, but not really somewhere I would want to live on a regular basis and certainly not somewhere that would make watching a scary movie any less terrifying than it already was. The Conjuring was easily the scariest movie I have seen, possibly because I steer clear of scary things for the most part these days. That's right, even to this day. But even back then, I remember having to hug my best friend Olivia at the time, because she was sobbing over the plot twists and jump scares of the film. When all was said and done, it must have been past 1 a.m., Every girl at the party was either doubled up or tripled up in their sleeping bags because at this point, everybody was having a bad time. But fortunately, within the next 30 minutes or so, everybody fell asleep. That was, everybody but me. My mind was fixated on the fact that The Conjuring was based on a true story. And when I was doing my best not to think of that, the only other thing that popped into my head was how badly I needed to pee and how the bathroom was upstairs. Cutting to the chase, I was faced with a series of which is worse type scenarios. Was it worse to attempt to wake up one of the other girls to come with me because I was too scared to go up alone? Was it worse to wet the bed when I realistically knew there was no way I could hold it until the morning? Or was it worse to face my fears and just go upstairs alone? Ultimately, I choose the last because either of the former had just sounded too embarrassing. I really couldn't afford to have this sleepover go badly when I was rarely invited to events like this, and even rarer, allowed to attend. It took me every bit of ten minutes to work up the courage to get up the stairs. And that's when all eyes were on me. Every porcelain doll in the living room felt like it was shooting targets through me, and frankly, I felt like I could hurl. I wasted no time skating to the bathroom and slamming the door behind me despite having done my best to keep quiet. I did my business, went to wash my hands, and nearly jumped out of my skin when I glanced at the mirror. For a split second, a grimacing, almost blurry figure was hovering behind me, but in the blink of an eye, it was gone. I washed my hands faster than you can imagine, flung open the door, prepared to sprint back down to the basement, and that's when I saw it. The same figure that was in the mirror, semi-transparent, grimacing, and dark. I remember feeling instantly cold and that the air around me seemed to go still. I slammed the door and I screamed a scream so vile I had no doubt it woke the neighbors. The next few minutes passed in a blur and it's hard to sort out the memories through the haze. All I know is that eventually Lisa's parents came crashing into the bathroom, pleading for me to tell them what was wrong. But I was in like a trance. I couldn't talk. My mom picked me up that night and I have never been so happy in my life to see her. Needless to say, I never went to Lisa's again, nor did I engage with scary movies or sleepovers until well into my high school years. I can't say for sure what it was that I saw that night. All I know is its presence was demonic, and it felt like something straight out of The Conjuring. Regardless of what it was, it's obvious that it affected me tremendously. And like I said, even to this day, I get goosebumps thinking about it. When you live on a farm in Texas, you hear all kinds of crazy stories. Stories of things that you can't quite explain. You always laugh and say, yeah, okay, whatever, until it happens to you. And then you become the crazy person telling the story. Well, this happened to me. So now I guess I am that crazy person telling that crazy story. I was helping a family friend out on their farm. They ran cows, horses, a few goats, and chickens. Pretty typical for a family farm in Texas. I remember we were all sitting around after a long, hard day. I was sunburnt and cranky, but I was still adjusting to the Texas heat. In my opinion, there is a real difference between it and heat anywhere else. But anyway, we were sitting around talking about our day, My friend started telling us about what happened to him the night before. He had gone out to check the cattle because something had woken him up. 
He had just made it to the fence line when he started hearing something strange and realizing that the animals were shifting uncomfortably. He figured we had some coyotes out and let the dogs loose for some protection. He listened and watched a bit, but then he didn't hear anything else and the dogs didn't react to anything, so he headed back to bed. As we listened to him, we basically just shrugged off the story. Coyotes aren't uncommon and the dogs help keep the herd safe, so we weren't too worried. This was all pretty common. We had done a head count as per usual when making our morning and nightly rounds and everybody had been accounted for. We wrapped up our post-work hangout and we all headed into the house for bed. However, that did not last long. It was only a few hours later when I heard a horse scream. Now, if you've never heard a horse scream, count yourself lucky. I jumped up and raced outside, but I didn't hear anything more. I didn't let that fool me, though. I knew that something was out there because horses are very intuitive. I grabbed my flashlight and woke my buddy up. He was an insanely deep sleeper, telling him to get up and grab his gun. I didn't know what we were going to find, but we were going to find out. He threw on his boots and we headed to the pasture. All of the animals were on high alert. The horses were tossing their heads, snorting, and frantically stomping their feet. The cattle were milling about, staying close together and snorting. I had never seen the animals act this way, not over a coyote at least. I pointed my flashlight toward the back of the field, swiping it left and right. I couldn't see anything, but the anxiety pouring off the livestock was thick. I could almost taste it. It was starting to set me on edge, too. So I jumped the gate and I walked along the fence line, ready to jump out if they started to panic. I did not want to get trampled. I was only about 20 steps in when I saw movement. I couldn't make out what I was seeing, but it was fast and it stayed in the shadows. I walked closer, trying to shine the light where I had last seen movement, but I couldn't catch anything. I started to give up and let my buddy know that whatever it was, was gone, and that we should just bring the horses in for the night. But that's when we heard it. It was growling low and deep, but it was also loud. It made me jump, and my hands started shaking. I began backing up, not wanting to take my eyes from where it had been. I didn't want to lose sight of it but I also wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. I blinked, and when I opened my eyes, glowing eyes had appeared low to the ground, and they were staring back at me. I heard one of the horses behind me snort, and I felt the air rushing past me as they started to run and mill around. They could sense something was wrong, all while I was watching something I couldn't understand form in front of me. I kept my flashlight low to the ground as the eyes grew larger, I knew it was getting close. I raised the light quickly, and I screamed like a banshee when I saw a dog-like creature creeping towards me with no fur, completely naked. But what scared me the most was the long, sharp claws and fangs. I started stuttering, trying to talk to my buddy to get him over to me. I seriously couldn't believe my eyes. I had always laughed when people told their stories, but then this... As I watched, the creature stalked towards me, opening its fang-filled mouth and growling. Luckily, I realized that my buddy had stayed outside the fence, but he was now screaming at me to get out of there. He was afraid to take a shot and hit me or one of the horses. I started running backwards, one hand on the fence rail to guide me. I didn't want to take my eyes off of this thing again. Finally, I made it back to the gate and to where my friend was. He took the flashlight and he kept it aimed exactly where I had it. I climbed over the gate so as not to take any chances about losing a frightened animal, and by the time I came down on the other side, it was gone. I was shaking and stuttering. I don't think I have ever been that scared. We then agreed that we should go wake everybody up. We needed to do a count and to make sure that we had someone on guard in shifts. As we all made our way back out to the pastures, everything was calm. None of the animals were on alert. The dogs were even silent as they ran ahead of us. Nothing seemed wrong. At least, not at first. We started our count and quickly discovered that we were short one horse. The cows and goats were all there, but we were missing one of the mares. So we started to hunt for her. She couldn't have gone too far. It didn't take long to find her. We had barely started walking the pasture when one of the other hands yelled out. We all ran over 
and there she was, but she was gone, with only three puncture wounds in her neck. We spent the rest of the night working in shifts to protect the rest of the herd. It was a long, sad, scary night, one that I would never want to relive. I can't laugh anymore when I hear about the crazy sightings out there. I've lived it. It isn't made up. It's scary. It is real. I've tried for a long time to forget this freaky experience that I had about 10 years ago. Even still, when I close my eyes to sleep, there are times that I can't get it out of my head. It's not easy to talk about this, but I've bottled it up for too long. My mom, sister, and I were on a trip to the coast. We didn't go on a lot of trips, not since my dad left. Having a single mom doesn't make for the easiest life, but she tried. She definitely seemed super excited, but didn't tell us where we were going. It's a surprise, she said. We stopped a few times for snacks and bathroom breaks. It was a really bright day and hot. I remember sweating. We drove along the coast. My sister and I stuck our heads out the window. It was the first time that we had seen the ocean. And to date, that weekend was the last. We pulled up in front of a really tall house. There must have been like 20 steep stairs leading up to the door. At first I thought it was a joke. The place looked like it was about a hundred years old, and I thought there was no way anybody really could live in there. But my mom assured us that it was a friend of a friend's house and we could stay the weekend. She even held up the key and showed it to us, proving her point. So we all headed up the steps, unlocked the door, plopped our bags inside. The inside of the house was no better. It felt like a house out of a horror movie to me. But what choice did I have being a young teen? I mean, I had to trust my mom, right? Anyway, the first thing we did was head outside to check out the area a bit and see what all was around. When we got back, we walked into the house only to hear something strange. It sounded like a weird clicking inside the walls. I asked my mom and sister if they heard it. My sister ignored me, and my mom just said it was my imagination and that I should just go unpack my bag. I listened, and I didn't hear it again. So then my mom and sister headed to the kitchen to make dinner. I walked around the house, turning on the lights as I went, and I heard it again. Clicking sounds. This time it sounded like it was coming from upstairs. I wasn't sure if I was ready to scope that out alone. I'm not exactly the bravest person in the world. So I stood at the bottom of the steps and I watched up the landing, up above. While I stood there looking, I swear I saw something pass across from one side to the other, and I heard that clicking again. I didn't scream or anything, but believe me, I wanted to. When I turned around, my mom was standing in the doorway to the kitchen. She asked me if I was okay and said that she had heard me making a gasping sound. I looked upstairs again and didn't see anything, just shadows and dust, so I told her all was good. We ate dinner in the dining room. I still couldn't believe we were staying in this place. To me, it was all old and dirty and gross, but my sister didn't seem to be bothered by it, and my mom was trying not to bring attention to anything bad so that the trip would be positive for all of us. It started to get dark after we cleaned up the kitchen and washed the dishes, and then in the dark silence, I could hear every creak of the floorboard as I walked around. I went into the bathroom and heard the noise again clicking sounds, now somewhere above me. Whatever was in this house was upstairs. I was convinced of that, and yet at the same time it seemed to be everywhere that I was, which was becoming very concerning. So then my mom and sister and I played a board game in the living room. I couldn't concentrate on it though, I was too busy listening to the house. Finally my sister started yawning and my mom said it was probably time to go to bed. So I headed to my room luckily on the first floor, and I locked the door behind me. It felt silly, but it also seemed like the right thing to do. I mean, I sat there on the bed, and I literally just stared at the door handle, waiting for it to turn. I was convinced that would happen. But instead of seeing anything, I eventually laid over and fell asleep. And then I woke up suddenly and realized that it was the sound of that clicking noise again. And it was louder now, right outside the door. I was now sitting up on the bed, not knowing what to do. I thought about yelling for my mom, but that seemed too chicken, even for me. 
Should I go over and check it out? But I couldn't do it. Not only was my mind not into it, but my legs would not budge. The noise stopped again, and now I really couldn't sleep. There was no way. I knew that much. And then the worst thing in my life happened. I had to pee, and the bathroom was out the door and down the hall. I tried to hold it and then ignore it, but when you have to go, you have to go. And I'm sure my anxiety levels had a lot to do with that. So I crept out of the room and I walked quietly down the hall to the bathroom. I listened carefully for that clicking sound. Thank goodness it was silent except the sounds of my feet creaking on the floorboards. I opened the bathroom door and flipped on the light. Right behind me now, clicking sounds. This time I couldn't contain the scream. I tried and it came out as a yelp. And even though I was scared out of my mind, I was still embarrassed. I spun around and saw something I will never forget. It made me regret turning on the bathroom light. Following me was this grotesque, childlike thing, crawling back and forth. It was staring at me from deep, black eyes, and the face had no features except those eyes and a wide, empty mouth, just a hole in the bottom of the face. I moved to my right, and it skittered to its left to stay in front of me. It was fast and crawling on all fours, sort of like a huge insect. And I could now see that the clicking sound was made by its hands and feet on the wooden floor. The nails long and yellow, and it was filthy and pale like paper. I couldn't contain my scream this time. It came out of my mouth full on as I watched the thing scurry away on all fours, the clicking as loud as ever. I then watched as it scurried up the stairs. My mom burst out of her room and looked at me. Her eyes were huge and frightened at having heard me scream. She saw me and ran over. She asked if I was okay, but I couldn't say anything. I couldn't get out the words. She didn't turn and look at the stairs or anything, and to this day I still don't know if she heard what I heard. But I know that she didn't see what I saw. I slept in her room that night and the rest of the weekend. Well, I didn't sleep, but I was in there. I'm 40 years old now, single mom, I have three kids. I've always been really close with my first cousin ever since we were little kids growing up. We've always had somewhat of a bond, I guess you could say. I just love him to death. He can be dramatic, but he keeps things exciting. We didn't have it easy as kids, but we had each other. We were only eight months apart, so we've always been pretty close, even through our distance. Recently, I moved my children and myself from New York to Pennsylvania in order for them to be closer to their father. So, instead of them having to commute to see him, we relocated our home base so that the kids could stay put in Pennsylvania. That way, I would commute back to New York for work, for the time being at least. After a couple of years of doing this, it was getting repetitive and old. So one Monday night, I got a call from my cousin. It was different because usually when he calls, he's the one that has a problem and needs to discuss something pertaining to his life. And I listen. But this phone call was different. When I answered the phone, I was busy braiding one of the girl's hair, and I probably said something along the lines of, Hey, what's up? Are you okay? And he said, Yes, I'm actually fine this time. I just wanted to know how you were doing, if you were okay. I said I was fine, just busy trying to get the kids in bed after their baths. It's a school night, and trying to get ready for my next trip to work into New York on Wednesday. I asked him why, what's up? Again, he said, oh, nothing. Just call me back when you have a minute to chat. It's no big deal. I agreed to do so. I told him I loved him, and I hung up the phone shortly after. That Wednesday, after the kids went to their dad's house, I departed Pennsylvania for New York as usual to go to work for three days while my children were with their father. I had forgotten to call my cousin back and to see what his concerns were. En route traveling through the city... Actually, it was after I had passed the city and I was on the parkways heading toward eastern Long Island. I had this near-death experience, so to speak. Long story short, I had almost gotten into a car accident, and within a matter of three to five seconds prior to the near accident, I saw my life flash before my eyes, and I knew that this was going to be the end. That this was it. I was about to die in this car accident, and my kids were no longer going to have their mother. Somehow, though, by the grace of God and my guardian angels and whatever else was watching over me that night, 
I had been able to do some stuntman driving car maneuvers that managed to allow me to avoid hitting the car that had just cut me off, and also avoid hitting the other cars that were traveling alongside me in traffic. And after I'd done this crazy stunt move in my old, beat-up GMC Envoy, I realized that I was still driving on the parkway, and somehow not dead. I took a long while to shake it off. I drove another mile or so and then had to pull over because it was so overwhelming. There was no way I should have been alive, really, and somehow I was. I grabbed my necklace, which carries my grandfather's Tiffany keychain with his initials engraved on it, and my grandmother's gold cross, and I kissed them relentlessly, giving thanks, and eventually I was able to continue driving on to work, with the rest of the trip going uneventful, so to speak. I was blown away. I was unable to talk about it for days. It was just too astonishing, and I wasn't even really able to comprehend how that happened, or what force had been protecting me, and why I was still alive. I just knew that I was grateful, and there were many definite angels watching over me that evening. So after I finished my three days of work and returned back to Pennsylvania, I was sitting with my children once again, doing something when my phone rang. Again, it was my cousin, and I realized that I had never called him back. So I answered the phone, and I said, Hello, I'm so sorry I never called you, and I asked what he wanted to talk about. After he was done making sure I was okay, he continued to tell me about this dream that he had had. Now, this dream that he had had was prior to me leaving for my last New York trip and having had that near-death, close-encounter car accident experience, or whatever you want to call it, and me nor him ever having told each other about it. So he described this near accident to me in every detail except that he was in the car with me when it was happening. This was in his dream that he had had the week prior to my last trip north for work. I couldn't believe the words that were coming out of his mouth. He said that in his dream, he and I were driving. Somebody pulled out in front of us, and we knew that we were going to smash into the truck, right into the back of it. That we looked at each other and said, oh my gosh. And then we continued to crash into the back of the car, causing all the traffic around us to crash as well. Basically a multi-car pileup, in which we both and many others had died. He had just described my close encounter car accident almost to a T. It was like in his dream he had left his astral body or something and was with me in the car while I was driving. Somehow he had prevented it from happening, maybe? But this was prior to it happening, as if some kind of a warning which made him want to reach out to me to make sure I was okay. Somehow he had this premonition dream about what was going to happen to me, but he was with me during the time and was able to prevent it from happening. Somehow. That's how I read it. I can't really wrap my head around it fully, though. It's so hard to comprehend. But I was mind-blown. He had called to check in on me because of a crazy dream that he had had about us getting into a car accident together and dying. And describing the car accident exactly as it happened to me, with the exception of, I survived somehow managing to continue driving down the road unharmed, the car unaffected, and me being alone two to three days prior to it even happening. Now, I've never told anybody about this near-death close encounter to a car accident experience other than him. I still wasn't even able to wrap my head around how I had somehow survived it and the wheels didn't go flying off the car. He had described to me exactly it. I'm still dumbfounded. I always knew we had a bond, but this is on a whole new level. So whatever, I'm beyond grateful that I'm still here with my children. And for whatever reasons, I definitely had some guardian angels that night. Maybe the love and protection of my still living, lucid dreaming with astral projection cousin did it too. The world is way weirder and more mysterious than we know it to be. That's for sure. I count my blessings, and I hope you do too. Thanks, Maggie. I kind of have an obsession with trail cameras. When I was 10, I asked for one for Christmas, and I was so excited when I got it. I think I've owned a dozen of them over the course of my life, and I'm 35 now. It's really nerdy just how into trail cams I am. I'm the kind of guy that watches reviews on them on YouTube and is keeping up on the latest models. Everyone has their own weird obsession, and mine is trail cameras. I have my trail cam on my grandfather's property. It's about an hour north from where I live. 
He owns about a hundred acres out there, and I've had my cameras all over the property for a long time. I download the cameras and move their positions every couple of weeks. Most people use their trail cams for hunting purposes. They're trying to figure out if they have any big bucks wandering around their area that they can hope to get. I don't really use them like that. I mostly just use them to try and get cool pictures of animals. I actually even have a spreadsheet that I use to keep track of my sightings. At some point, back when I was in high school, I looked up all the possible animals I could catch on my camera. I made a list of them, and I've been tracking them ever since. Raccoons and possum are the most common sighting, but I see a lot of deer, too. I thought I was looking at a deer when I caught this one thing on camera. I've had a big old eight-point wandering around for a year or so now. I have a dozen great pictures of it that I show to my buddies. The pictures started from pretty far away. The camera was in night vision mode when this happened, so the pictures are pretty grainy and tinted green. They're also far away, but you can pretty clearly make out these shining eyes and the silhouette of an antler rack against the moon. When I first saw these pictures, I was pretty excited because of the rack. It was absolutely huge. I knew that I had probably never seen this particular buck before, and that made me pretty happy. That's why I put those cameras out. It's to see new animals. I got about a dozen pictures of this thing. My camera takes pictures whenever it senses motion. It seems like the creature was moving towards my camera almost as if it could sense that it was there. And then as it got closer and closer, the image became clearer. I began to realize that it was not a deer at all. For one thing, it seemed to be bipedal, and it was standing on two legs for the most part and would occasionally use its front arms for support, sort of like a gorilla. Also, it was way too tall for a deer. In one image, it's standing like a man, and its rack is probably eight feet in the air. If that whole deal with it standing on two legs hadn't tipped me off that it wasn't a deer, its head and body certainly would have. Its face was long like a deer, but even in those grainy green trail cam photos, it was apparent that it was like a skull. I wondered if maybe this was some deer with rotting flesh disease. And then its body was weird too. It's like its whole torso was wrapped in some sort of a cage and was extremely thin. In one photo, its body was turned so that it was silhouetted against the moon and I could almost make out hip bones. And then as I was scrolling through these photos, I was becoming really uneasy. I was sitting in my bedroom, but it felt like something was watching me. And as I looked closer at the photos, a chill ran down my spine. I had to get up and turn on my bedroom light because I felt like something was hiding in the shadows. I think that what really made me feel that way was the creature's eyes. In every single photo, they were bright, way brighter than the normal reflection of light in a raccoon or deer's eyes. I felt like they were looking at me, straight at me, even though I was just looking at pictures. And this feeling honestly made me kind of freak out. I didn't understand what it was, but I felt like I was panicking. The pictures were from miles away, but I felt like this creature was right here in my bedroom, all at the same time, or maybe just outside my window, staring at me. So that's why I made the really rash decision, and it was really stupid, and I regret it now. I wish I had known that other people had stories of this thing, and maybe I'd have found a way to keep them, but I deleted all the photos. I know it was dumb and impulsive, but it was the only way I could get that feeling to go away. It was like I was being haunted like some evil spirit was hovering around, and it made me feel terrified and uneasy and like I needed to run and hide, like those eyes were just staring at me, wanting to rip me apart. If I still had the photos, I certainly would have sent them. I know that this story may seem far-fetched, but it really happened. I've been avoiding going into the woods at night ever since then, just in case. Every time I check my trail cams, I get a pit in my stomach, really. And I'm really worried that I'm going to see that thing again. Part of me wants another picture, but part of me hopes I never see it again. I hope I can just get back to what life was like before I ever saw this thing. My parents own a large ranch out here in Wyoming. On it, they have their own house at one end of the property. And I fixed up and took over an old ranch hand's house on the opposite end. And I live here by myself. The ranch is large enough that neither house is visible to the other, but it's an easy, quick drive over in a car or a ranch vehicle. 
so it was November when everything happened. I had just finished making some food for a potluck with friends, and I was washing the dishes when I heard this knock on the door. I looked through the glass along the side of the door to see who it was, assuming it would be my mom coming to rant about my father like she often does. But it was two younger kids. They stood right next to each other, looking down towards their feet. One looked to be maybe 13, and he had dark brown hair and pale skin. The other was a young girl with long ponytail braids. She might have been nine or ten. I opened the main door, but I left the screen door between us shut and locked. I asked them what they were up to, being friendly and approachable because they were just kids. But it did strike me as weird that they were out wandering around so late. It was like 9.30 at night. But I know that some of the neighbors do have rowdy kids, so I was just assuming that that's who these two were. I remember them saying to me, We got lost. Can we come in and wait for our parents? Their tone was completely void of emotion, and that sort of rubbed me the wrong way. Like, if they were lost kids, they would sound afraid, right? So I asked them if they called their parents. They said, our parents are on the way. Can we come inside? I was very hesitant to let them in, but I always try to be helpful. So I unlocked the door and let them inside. I mean, they were kids after all. So I gestured for them to have a seat in the living room, and they both walked over. The little one grabbed the older one's hand as they sat down. I asked them where their parents were. If they lived nearby, I thought maybe I could just drive them next door or something if need be. The older one looked at me with a completely emotionless face and said, Our parents are on the way. I felt sick when I made eye contact with this kid. His eyes were not normal. They were pitch black, in fact. Like looking into a deep well that you can't see the bottom of. The hairs on my arms and neck stood up, and I instantly regretted letting them inside. The little one stood up then and asked to use the bathroom. Her eyes were just as dark as the boys. Something was seriously wrong, but I said yes, and I pointed to the bathroom door. Both of them went in together, and I quickly rushed to my phone. I texted my parents so I wouldn't raise any alarm with the kids. Something was very, very wrong, and I didn't want to risk making this any worse but I got a message back saying that the text message had failed to send. I'd never had any issues with reception on the ranch before, so that was weird. The lights then flickered in my house for a moment, and then the power cut out completely. And then I heard thudding and crashing from inside the bathroom, almost like the kids were knocking things over in the dark. I feel bad for saying this, but I had no desire to help them. I wanted to run away as fast as I could from these creepy kids, actually. I turned the light from my cell phone on and pointed it towards the hallway where the bathroom was, and I nearly fell backwards in shock. Both of the kids were standing there, holding hands just outside the bathroom door, staring at me. Our parents are here, the boy said, and they both walked right out the door. I peeked through the window and watched them walk off towards the road and get into a car. The lights flickered back on shortly after it pulled away. I then drove over to my parents' house to tell them what had happened, but they had been asleep and didn't notice the power outage. I saw the time on their microwave, though, and it was flashing at 12.05, so I knew that theirs must have gone out, too. I tried to explain it away as a weird coincidence, but I know that there was something supernatural about the situation. After seeing those kids, some of the cattle on the ranch then went missing. My father and I were always careful about locking the barns and pens and making sure every animal was accounted for, so that was unusual. We take excellent care of our animals. They receive regular veterinary care, especially the pregnant moms. And then one of our goats, a pregnant goat who was having a normal and healthy pregnancy, had an entire stillborn litter just weeks before we were expecting her to give birth. Now I've been feeling extra fatigued lately, so I went to the doctor because it was unusual. I'm a healthy 25-year-old who eats well and gets plenty of exercise daily. They couldn't figure out what it was right away, but they're highly considering lupus. I haven't seen or heard from those two since that night, but I do know now that they weren't any of the neighbor's kids. We'd gone to a barbecue down the road since that night, and I asked the neighbors if they knew of or had seen any kids matching that description, and they had never heard of them, or seen them. And now, since that experience, I've heard strange tapping sounds on some of my windows. 
followed by flickering lights and weird disturbances in my electronics. Sometimes I think I see stuff out of the corner of my eyes, but I can't figure out if it's real or just my paranoia. Anyway, hopefully, I'll find a way to get past all of this. When I was 17, I saw something that to this day gives me chills. Ever since I was a child, I loved being in the water. I was on my community swim team since I was five, which eventually turned into me joining a travel team and competing in the tri-state area around New Jersey. Naturally, when I got to high school, I was excited to join the swim team and continue perfecting my craft. This passion eventually led me to a job as a lifeguard at the local beach, where I got paid to be around or in the water. Could a job really get better than that? Because I wasn't able to work until I finished school and practice for the day, I took the later shift at the beach, meaning the sun would start setting before the end of my shift. When it started getting near sunset, I would start to clear the water and turn off the beach lights, and then finally call it a night. While people technically could sneak back onto the beach after I closed, it typically didn't happen. I mean, there's a certain risk to swimming by yourself, especially at night, so most people were content with just heading home once the sun set. Me, on the other hand, I loved taking a dip after the shift. I was pretty confident in my swimming abilities and the water at the beach was relatively calm. So it didn't much bother me to be in the ocean by myself, even in the dark, since I didn't wade out too far or anything. So one Friday evening following my shift when the beach was empty, I found myself floating in the ocean, washing away the stresses of the week. As I floated on my back and looked up at the sky, the stars were abundant. And I remember thinking I'd never quite felt peace like I was feeling in that moment. I was humming to myself as the water lapped my arms, when suddenly something caught my eye. Darting across the sky, then pausing directly above my field of vision, was this tiny bright green light. At first I thought it was just a tiny insect hovering above me, maybe a discolored lightning bug who had found itself too far from shore. But reaching up in the air, I became more confident that this thing I was seeing was no bug, but in fact was miles away. Many miles. Maybe a shooting star? Maybe. But whatever it was, it seemed to hover right above me indefinitely, and I thought shooting stars typically fizzled out pretty quickly after they appeared. Suddenly I watched while five purple lights shot out from the single green light and they then formed a circle around the single light and began rotating counterclockwise. The display was hypnotizing, to say the least, but deep in my gut, I started feeling as though something wasn't right. There was no occasion for fireworks or any reason for strobe lights to be dancing in the air. In fact, peering back towards the shore, I could see the beach town was dark, not a person or party in sight. And with this, the mesmerizing lights began to turn rather terrifying to me, because now I was running out of justifications for them. As if in response to my growing fear, the lights stopped circling and suddenly converged into one blindingly bright beam. The beam transformed from green to yellow to white, and a quick look around me had me convinced that it was pointing directly into the water at me. It's difficult to describe the emotions that overcame me in that moment, but for all the strength I could manage, I knew I needed to get out of the water, and I needed to do it fast. Suddenly the beam began to grow, as if it were coming closer, and instinctively my body sank into the water. Realistically, I know the water wasn't going to protect me from whatever was tracking me, but I did know that the water was cloudy, and could give me at least a false sense of security under its haze. I held my breath longer than I had ever done before, and I fought against the little current in a dire effort to make it back to shore. My mind and my body were in conflict with each other. My body wanted to flail as fast as humanly possible, while my mind warned to keep calm and to not create a lot of movement. As I continued swimming, I could see the light from the beam above refracted into the water around me, but it was moving around in what I presumed to be searching motions. It was not shining directly onto me anymore, and whether or not that was thanks to me retreating into the water, I didn't care. I just wanted to remain as shadowed as possible. Finally, when I reached the shallows, I was unable to rely on the water for protection any longer. 
so I shot out of the ocean and onto the beach as fast as humanly possible, running across the sloshing wet sand. All the while, I was looking up at the beam in the sky, which was now again surrounded by colorful spinning lights, and I began screaming at the top of my lungs for help. My commotion must have been deafening, and as I continued sprinting up the beach, lights in the surrounding beach homes began to flicker on, and silhouettes filled the windows. I was waving frantically, begging anybody for assistance when finally my legs gave out and I found myself face up in the sand, once more looking up at the lights. I can't say for sure what happened, what happened next, but suddenly the lights converged into themselves once more, but instead of turning into a beam this time, they condensed back into that single green light that I had initially seen before they went shooting off into the distance and disappearing amongst the stars. In an instant, I was surrounded by people from the beach houses who were wrapping me in towels, carrying me to the safety of their home. They were all panicked. I could see it in their faces, having feared that I had been attacked by a shark or something, and they were asking me if I was hurt. It took me a minute to finally catch my breath, but I told them the truth. Not sure what they thought, but the truth was far more scary to me than the mere threat of a shark attack has ever been.